Hello, and welcome to m as Church Planting and Renewal Conversations. I'm Chris Vogel, Director of Next Gen Pastors, and serve m and as the Director of Ecosystems Development. There's an oft-repeated sentiment that everyone complains about the weather, but no one ever does anything about it. Oddly, there is a strange correlation between that and evangelism. We complain that people don't share the gospel, but we offer little to affect change. Now, there is a difference. The difference is that while we can't do anything to change weather, we can share the gospel. The question then is, are we willing to venture out to where the people are who need to hear of Christ's death and resurrection? Are we willing to speak to people like us, broken people? Will we go out into the wild? Al Dayhoff is with us today. He calls people to listen to hear, to step out of the echo chamber of the four walls of their church and step into the wild of the parish that is around them. In order to help pastors be better equipped messengers of the good news, we must consider how we engage those outside the church. And one way of doing that is through an evangelism residency that Al offers through Evangelize Today. E.T. for short. We have other guests with us. We're going to have them introduce themselves. But as always, thank you for joining with us today. And before we jump in, as always, there's the chat box, the Q&A box. Please feel free to throw us questions. This is meant to be a conversation, not just among our panelists, but if you're attending, um, we'd love to hear from you as well. And uh, as I said, with us are a number of guests and Al Dayhoff, um, speaking of being out in the wild, um, he is not in the confines of a nice, safe, comfortable office, or as Ron is, he's in a courthouse, uh, a, a whole different venue. Um, but Al, uh, tell us a little bit about what an ET residency is and what's, what was the impetus for this program? How does one get involved? So good. Good afternoon, Chris, and good to see you, my friend. Uh, thank you for all you do, by the way. Uh, Thank you for next gen. It it's making a difference, and please don't stop. I benefit from it, and all your ministry, and uh, plus you're my good friend. <laughs> so, you know, I took a journey from a, a traditional brick and mortar church and sat in a blues bar, and it became my parish, and a a journey began that I didn't expect. And dominoes began to fall that I really didn't set up. Um, and I guess I fell in love with the people in my blues bar and they became my parish. And, um, you know, Chris, I just did a, a seminar, a, a conference in Virginia Beach with a large group. And they kind of put their knee on my thread and on my neck and said okay what do you do in the wild because apparently i wasn't being clear enough and these words came out of my mouth as i began to pastor them and evangelism became part of that journey and this is one of the marks of the parish i am yours and you are mine and it began to grow and i began um, to get excited about my call and my place in ministry and guys started asking me to coach them and I said no I don't even know what I'm doing and I was writing some books and um and then I started saying okay and started incrementally taking people through that journey but then I found an opportunity to be a pastor to them and it's my job to get inside of them study them be their student, be their wingman, be their mentor and listen to them. And it has been a privilege. And I'm about somewhere between 50 and 60 residents that I've worked with and they have changed my life. Um, but we incrementally research our way into the wild and we do whatever baby steps it takes. So those are a few thoughts. Okay. Oh, great. Well, thank you. And so as we, um, kind of talk through this uh, again hope that in, the rest of you can begin to jump in as you do introduce yourselves you you, you you like using the word wild what's the wild anyone 
The wild for me are the um, recreation centers in uh, Chattanooga, where I uh, live. I direct Every Valley Leadership Academy, um, and the Lord led me into some civic involvement at the rec centers uh, at a time when the city was crying for um, people to come set up programs for uh, young people being drawn into gangs. And so a friend and I prayed and began to go to the rec centers to do Bible studies and um, evangelism. Um, and so that's my wild uh, and really the neighborhood around the rec center in East Chattanooga. Yeah. Uh, so, no, yeah. I think for, for a lot of PCA pastors, uh, that, that, that area and that kind of work would certainly be considered, considered wild outside what we're often used to. Good. Yeah, I think the general idea is that the wild is the world outside the church. And as we individually engage with different parts of the wild, it's like we draw a circle of love around a particular part of the wild, and that becomes our parish. So those are words that we use. The wild is the world out there, and a parish is a section of the wild that we enter into with love and understanding and listening ear. What, what, what I found interesting here as we uh, set up this panel, Al, and, and thank you for inv inviting your guys. We have a, a senior pastor of a, of a PCA church. Um, we have a guy who served as a, as a parish uh, pastor for years now as a consultant. It's Stephen, Stephen Cooper. Mark Arforth is the senior pastor of Greenville, South Carolina. Ron, as you had mentioned, you're, you're working in the context of, of youth centers and helping to mentor youth who are kind of in uh, difficult situations and some dangerous situations. And David, you're, a, you're an ARP pastor. I loved how you said it, a ARP pastor. Um, I forget what the middle thing was you said, but also a Uber and Lyft driver so you can you can meet meet people. Um, and, oh, you teach theology, evangelism, apologetics at Lake Point Academy. So that's a wonderful, diverse kind of background. Yeah. So then tell me, what what um, what what drew you into this? Um, what was involved in your residency, and and how did it all kind of affect you and, and come about? Mark, what, what, how, how did you get connected with, with Al? This is true confession time, perhaps. I, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, Mark Alverth in Greenville. Um, so, Al, um, Al was texting me uh, probably two years before I did any of this. I don't know how he got my info or anything like that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it sounds interesting to me. And, uh, uh, and then I got to talking to him. Uh, I, I don't remember all the ways that it happened, but uh, <clears throat> I remember being then becoming very interested in it. And I had a conversation with him. He called me and, uh, and then he put me with a couple of his residents. Um, and I called a couple of them. I had lunch with one and, uh, and I just, got really interested in his approach to evangelism and uh, knowing that I needed probably help. And, uh, and, but now after a year and three quarters, I have arrived and um, I am the evangelist of evangelists. <laughs> um, not. <laughs> So I got hooked up with him that way. One, one of the things that really drew me in is Al's uh, talking to me about my demons. And I think Al gave me, in that very first conversation, we had conversation about some, some stuff. And I think he gave me permission to, to send some of them packing. And it took a long time to get there, but I do I do think he gave me permission in, in some ways to put some of that behind me. You know, you never get rid of your demons, but so I think a year and a half of that is so I'm just really just coming into understanding the wild and um, uh, second thing I'll say and then I'll, I'll shut up, but I think what this program has done for me is that I at first, I was very hesitant to talk to anybody 
you know, tattoo interviews or whatever. And I find now that I'm not the least bit hesitant. It, it doesn't, it's, it's like second, I don't even think about it. And that, that that's a, that's, that's just the subtleties of uh, Al Dayhoff working on your psyche. There, I, I've got a problem with that, Al. What, what are you doing to me? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and there, there's an interesting correlation there with that. You know, again, we don't need to go into our individual stores and how that connects. You know, obviously, you know, don't want to, but there, there's a connection between that, that inward working of what God is doing in our life and our ability to engage those in different places than us. Um, and it, so this is, you know, we're not talking just a simple one, two, step, three step program, how to share your faith. It is understanding that whole how it all coalesces. David, what, what about you? How what what has been your experience with with the residency program, and how has it uh, affected you and and shaped you into to how God's using you in, in your your context? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and uh, I don't exactly re remember how Alan Al and I met, but. Um, I had just been through five years of church planning in the ARP and I'd go sit in the coffee shops and try to meet people and everything that the church plant coach said. And I probably had maybe four or five interactions with people that were outside the church. And I met Al and he gave uh, me some tools and equipped me to, it was something as simple as seeing a tattoo in Walmart and going over and saying, Hey, what does that have a story? Um, I, the church plant stopped. I had to find some other way to make a living. So a friend introduced me to driving for Uber and Lyft and people would get in my car and they would begin the conversation saying, oh, are you retired? Or they would see my hair and, you know, are, um, are you retired? And I said, no, I'm a pastor of a church. I do this part time. And then there'd be this pause. And then some of the most incredible questions would come across the back seat, which uh, they were asking me questions, and it became in, in this dialogue, and Rock Hill's so small, I sort of pick up the same people a lot, um, but I went from five years of very few conversations with people outside the church to um, literally thousands of conversations, mm. and uh, it it showed me that now Al would, when I first met Al, he would say this thing like 85% of the people out there aren't coming back into the brick and mortar church. And I was looking for answers of why my strategy to plant a church wasn't working and how to fix it. And that just stuck with me. And I had to orbit ET and Al for about three years before he finally just said, are you going to jump in or not? <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. And but what it's done, uh, it's helped our church. Uh, I've got three or four of my elders and a couple of people in my church that are starting to venture out and to ask people about uh, their tattoos and things. And it's there's this sort of renewed sense of uh, getting outside of the four walls of the church and to engage with people. Uh, the class that I teach at Lake Point, I've got four seniors, and uh, we take field trips over to the local Starbucks, and that we do something called a five-question interview. These four students are just amazing. They go and walk right up to people, and hey, can I, can we interview you for a class? And people are open to it. They engage with them, and uh, it's I was ready to quit ministry, sell all my books, and just go find something else to do. And this has given me a new energy and a new passion for uh, uh, about evangelism. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's, yeah it, it's an interesting uh, kind of correlation. It was, mm -hmm. it, it, it seems really simple when you think about it. Get the pastor mm -hmm. out of the church, and it can energize him in the context of the church. And it, it, it did for me. Yeah. And and it also, I'm hearing this is is not just a a, pro, a program for pastors to help wayward pastors do, do their work. You're saying you have elders and other members engaging it too. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Chris, can I jump yeah. in? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I've seen that's happened 
I'm in my fourth year with Al. And so I'm obviously a, I'm not just the hair club president. I'm also a client, right? Um, I, uh, one of the things that I've found is that we all want to do evangelism and there are lots of ways to do evangelism. And Al has actually steps that he leads us through that like Dave talked about the, the tattoo inter- or the five question interview. Mark's talked about the tattoo interview. There are these things that we do to build relationships where we're listening to people. But in my, in my mind, the most lasting evangelistic changes that happen, like the, the most progress that we make in our evangelism is when our evangelism is organically connected to how we disciple people. You know, I think so often evangelism is like, oh, here's the canned phrases and words and presentation I need to do. But then discipleship in our church might look really different. And the bigger a disconnection there is between our evangelism and the discipleship, Mm. the less evangelism happens because we're just, it's, they're two different things. And what working with Al does is it organically links our own growth as disciples of Jesus with how we share the gospel with other people. And I think that's what causes the lasting transformation of the people that are residents for Al. So we change because Al helps us grow as disciples. And there's lots of ways that he does that with us. That way, when we begin to share, we are sharing out of the fullness of our own experience of Jesus in a way that invites people into our walk with Jesus. And the impact of that is not only do we change, but like Dave said, he's training his elders now, he's training his students now, and he's got people in his church. And so it actually empowers us not just to share in a way that's natural for us, but it gives us a process that we can bring other people along with. Good. Yeah, you mentioned something, one thing I took to all two things I picked up on there, what you're just saying. One was the, the separation, it seems, with evangelism discipleship that, that has taken place, I think, in a lot of our churches. But recognizing, I've seen it in other contexts in which the way in which we bring somebody into the church is the way they're going to expect to be fed ongoing. So what is it in what you have kind of gotten out of the ET residency and, and through this experience that has then helped shape discipleship as well? If that makes sense. And, oh, and yeah. anyone, yeah. I mean, and it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I would say that for my experience, I've seen each of us because of our own journeys have like Al has responded to what God's doing in each of our lives in unique ways. So it really is unique to each of us, but it's consistent with, principles of like so for me a lot of it was emotional health learning to to grieve well learning to be honest about my emotions and then learning that god actually is very emotional like not just in the person of jesus in the new testament but himself as god in the old testament he has experienced all of my emotions and created a safe space for me to be honest about what i was going through the difficulties i was dealing with and as al has helped to make space for me to feel what I'm feeling in the presence of God. Now, this is what I do, not just in evangelism, but also in discipleship. So I create space now for other people, whatever they're feeling, I let them know that it's okay. I let them know that God feels that way too, and has felt that way, and is with you as you feel that way. Yeah, for me, uh, the um, you froze, Stephen. So oh, no, you're back. Um, for me, the I think one of the one of the helpful things has been that Al talks about is that your demon is or your place of weakness is the bridge point to the wild. Um, but I agree with Stephen. I also think it's your bridge point to fellow Christians um, because discipleship happens when when people are being honest with one another and not um, just uh, putting on a, uh, you know, some kind of a a show of obedience um, somehow. And um, it's been very helpful. Hmm. Let's explore that a little bit, because I think that's a a critical part of a lot of what I hear with guys who um, work with you, Al, and such, and I know it as well in our conversations through, through the last several years. 
again, I think we often think of evangelism as I'm walking somebody through a couple steps. I'm sharing some points of information. How is it or why is it? What's at the core when we think about the struggles we have? The You know, again, the one book, how you've done the genius in your wound. You know, why is that? so helpful in this process of evangelism, of discipleship, of engaging with others inside the four walls of the church, but outside as well. What, what, what have you seen? And Al, you, from your experience, what, what, what do you think is behind all of that? So um, there's a couple thoughts that come to mind. One of them is in this life cycle in history, we are what I call sort of a giant presentation factory. And, you know, the PhD presenter is building, the scholar pastor is building scholar congregations. And we take that DNA out into the space outside of the church. And it usually doesn't go well. And the image of God has gotten so desperate to talk in this time and space. It's writing its secrets all over itself in permanent ink. And I still couldn't see it. I still thought if I would listen to reply, in other words, I would only wait for them to stop talking. Then I would have something to say. And, um, and that didn't go well either. The epic pivot that has taken place in my life is when I sat in the blues bar for three years, I sat in my in the bar for three years and didn't talk, Chris. And because I wanted to see if I could hear what I could hear. And I realized I didn't know the language of the wild. And, and my bar, by the way, is full of people that run the world in DC. And what I found is this dynamic that when I gave that space to them, rather than hijacking it with my presentation, not only did they keep talking, they started doing all the work. And the epic pivot is this, that we have built evangelism around this construct. It is the character of our presentation. Okay, I don't want to throw that out. But we would get it just in right order. They would say this, we would say that, we would do this. And the wild has done an epic pivot and it's the character of the person giving the presentation that is now there. In other words, um, and I found this is that once my parish experienced my character over three years of the pastoring and listening, they started asking questions. And Chris, one of the questions I get all the time, I just got at my last conference, well, when do you present? And I say, when they ask, and they do. To say this in a different way, I think we have three questions that are not getting at the issue. Um, when do you present? How many converts have you had? When will that person get in worship? I think the epic question of our time is, are you pastoring five to 50 non-Christians? And that takes time for the wild to experience our character. Mm. What, what, do you, what are you hearing, uh, Chris? Yeah, no, there, there's, yeah, as always, there's a, a lot there. It's certainly, and uh, Michael Barber, who's a hospital chaplain, had said, you know, he said, I learned in chaplaincy was to listen more than you talk. And if, any counseling training we've had is always about listening. But as pastors, it, we're expected, we're trained, we're educated to be the scholar in residence and to be, you know, we're paid per word. So if I, I have to, I justify my existence and my value by how much oh, I know and oh, can talk. I love that. We're paid per word. Yeah, Pastor Cooper, we need to write that down. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that is one of the things that 
it, 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 and once we start doing that, and I, like David, as you were talking about, you know, driving Uber, what you described in some ways was a little flipped. They they started they were asking you questions, you know. Okay, what? Okay, you know, we always I, whenever I get an Uber, and especially if I'm when I'm with my wife, I'm kind of the guy who gets on a plane, and likes to be quiet, or get an Uber and just smile and go have a good evening. But uh, but she said, "How long have you been doing this?" And and you know what? What do you enjoy about it? And she'll get the conversation going. She's good at that. So in your context, they started asking you questions. So how how did that then continue to transpire in those kind of conversations? Because what, what you described in, intrigues me as a as a way of getting out there. When I first started with Al, he he basically said, "I'm giving you permission to go out into the wild." And it was like something came off my heart. And I was already in the car presenting. I would, I read all the evangelism books and they teach you how to steer a conversation towards a spiritual conversation. I was, I was doing all that, but this was something different that um, it became, it became a, a place where I had to listen and not present so much and he's right when when will they when do we present it's when they it's when they ask us and just uh with some of the tattoo interviews um i had one guy he had he's his 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 question was um is god out to get me mm. it was I had, I'd never had anybody ask me that in church or out of church. And so it just opened up new, new areas of conversation, new branches of mm -hmm. conversation that I'd, I'd never had before. Hey, Chris, I, I had an epic come to Jesus time in my own life. I was in my latter forties, this dissidence, what am I doing? I'm, teaching more Christianity to Christians, okay? That's all good, and it's our calling. But I read a verse, 1 Peter 3.15, it said, be sure to have an answer, okay? And, and that's why I went to seminary. That's why I got, that's why I read a lot of books. That's why I go to seminars. That's why I go to, you know, uh, webinars like this, so that I have an answer. But for some reason, my whole life, I didn't see the rest of the verse. It says, when people ask you. Mm -hmm. And I had to come to a, I said, why, why does nobody ever ask me about why I'm a Christian? And that was one of the meltdowns, so to speak, in my own soul. And I was walking on Christian carpet, doing Christian handshakes, drinking Christian coffee, doing Christian set. Why, what has happened to me? And that dissidence led me to go think about this in a blues bar. And that was a God thing and it became my parish. But I sat and didn't talk for three years. I was on their turf. And so another quick thought is what Dr. Offarth was talking about is there's a problem that when we do go out into the wild, can we listen? And in ET language, we talk about listening, hearing, holding, and defending. I unpack that in the confessor book. But we found that we're so full of noise inside we can't hear what other people are saying. So we up our presentation, you know, I'm this walking pulpit, right? And so I hijack the space rather than giving it to them because I had so much noise inside here. Mark, what are you thinking? <laughs> well, I'm thinking that, um, um, in my lifetime, so I, I was a college professor for 10 years in secular universities. And I probably presented the gospel to every person I came in contact with, um, every faculty, every student. And, um, and 
and I was a presenter and uh, I had a pretty slick uh, presentation and I saw exactly no one come to Christ. No one. And um, well, I take that back. Uh, in, in subsequent years, people have called me and told me they came to Christ and that there was something there. But I'm just saying in general, I, the Lord uses anything, of course. But in general, I wasn't uh, wasn't doing that. And it takes it takes some discipline not to respond or try to manipulate the conversation to uh, some kind of presentation. And um, and so that's what I'm thinking. I, I, I'm learning to those four. I think those four uh, categories are are so good listening to hear and then to hold it and then to defend and you know i haven't quite gotten there completely but i've done a lot of listening in the in the last uh, last while so that's what i'm thinking and also just to be clear um we do listen a lot because i think listening and caring about what people have to say rather than just waiting to give a presentation it is one of the best ways that we image a God who is very concerned about what people are dealing with in their lives. And there is theological truth about who God is when we stop and hear and hold what people are feeling and what they've gone through. And, you know, Romans 2, 4 says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance and we image a God who is kind when we listen and hear people. And so there is a presentation of the person of God in our hearing, even before we present. Mm. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is that in Al's process, like we do actually have a time to formally present the gospel. Like there is a faith letter that we will write to people after we've had certain conversations that, and there's just an outline that you follow where we mm -hmm. review things that they've shared with us. We affirm like the significance of what people have shared with us. And then we talk about what Jesus has meant to us. And we ask them if they want to talk more about this. And so there is a formal presentation. Like all of us are sharing the gospel with people. It's not, you don't, we're not picking listening or sharing. Yeah. but it's putting listening in its appropriate first place so that when we share, people will feel like the person that's sharing with them cares deeply for them. Mm -hmm. No. So help me out here. I, you know, uh, for the, uh, the, the three, 30 years or whatever, I served as a pastor. Um, again, you know, life's busy. I've got a lot on my plate. Um, where, where, where do you find these people? Um, because I've, I've got a lot, lot to do here. How, how would you answer that? Uh, where, where do you go out into the wild? What are some of the options and opportunities that are right in front of us that, that you have found that have, have enabled you to engage this way? I think that that's a developing, uh, scenario and, um, for me, I, I've uh, I've tried to um, uh, the guy that plays bass for us in our church is the head of a organization called the Greenville Jazz Collective, a nonprofit that gets in the schools and uh, and they have they have small groups and big groups. They have a big band, and I actually play in the big band, and and so I, I've just tried several of the guys in that in our band are part of that and i'm just trying to to uh develop these relationships and be there and go to concerts and be with these guys um but i would say otherwise i just uh i was telling al that i had a guy come hook up my at t uh on tuesday and ended up having about a 30 to 45 minute conversation with him about his tattoo that he matched his wife's tattoo, but he's going to get it completely blacked in because she stepped out on him about three weeks ago and he's 30 years old and he has two kids and he's devastated. Yeah. That, I mean, it didn't take anything. I just had to ask one little question and it, that was all coming out. 
I have his number and I'm going to try to maybe follow up with him. But anyway, oh, yeah. so it's good stuff. No, that is good. Way to go, Mark. Yeah. One of our guys just put one word in there, fire pits. Um, just uh, there's there's nothing like sitting around a fire. And doing that in Wisconsin in February takes a lot of commitment. You need a big fire. Um, I, I, I know that all too well. But you no, know, and just it just inviting people to sit and talk and listen and and see what, what what's happening. I know for for me, some twenty years ago, I returned to a an avocational interest, and that was that was pottery, ceramics. And I worked in a gallery in a studio, and I partly I must admit, and you know, all honesty, it was my escape. It was a way to get away from people. Um, that didn't last real long. And I and I didn't want to real quickly say, I'm a pastor and this is my day off. Um, but it, it was very quickly, I was doing a lot more listening to, to people in, in their struggles because people don't have people that listen to them. That is a rare, it is a rare commodity in our world. Yeah. Any thoughts, Ron? Eyes on the road, eyes on the road. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I was just going to mention um, reading your local newspaper and help letting them help identify, you know, some needs in the community. Um, working with these young people, um, many of them don't feel like they have a voice. Uh, some of the reports um, interviewed kids who said, I don't feel like anybody thinks I'm smart because I go to a certain school. I don't have any you know, ideas that could help the community and things like that. So finding people who don't have a voice, finding people who have, you know, needs for family, um, being all things to all people, mm. um, you know, can be a lot of things. It's not that you're going in as a father necessarily, but um, I have a background in teaching and tutoring, and, and I went in the rec centers as a tutor. Uh, we offered programs on conflict resolution, actually using the Peacemaker uh, material doing Bible studies out of that, and now we're in the public schools doing classes on peacemaking mm. uh, in some of the uh, urban schools. So I think I'm I'm in a unique place in the Bible Belt where we have some freedom to do that as long as you do it well. Um, but just looking for those cracks in in your uh, community and just asking them how you know don't go in with an agenda, but just asking them how how you can serve, and you know the gospel will come up. You know why are you doing this? Your character. How did you? How, why are you? You know, why are you doing this? Um, Al, when I encountered Al, he, he was just articulating some convictions I've had in evangelism for a long time. One of which, when I started reading Puritans, is that uh, sanctification is the unassailable apologetic. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I studied apologetics in seminary. I, I looked at a lot of the historical things and the philosophical things, but you know, your godly life is something they, they, they just can't argue with. And so, um, yeah, we've overcome racial barriers, socioeconomic barriers, uh, generational. There's a lot of, you know, older people uh, within these communities that don't trust the young people that are afraid of these guys, uh, guys especially. And um, we're, we're trying to empower churches to and, and give them a vision of God's glory to be able to go in and, and trust him in situations where they might be afraid. Mm. That's good. That's good. Chris, one of the things about these men is they all have parishes in the wild. Ron Lowe, you know, Ron, I'm going to talk like you're not here. Um, he, he, he's this single kind of nerdy, wonky single man. Um, and he has 200 African American kids in his parish. And um, he drives them around in his car and they are the only spiritual, um, they're the only father, most of them know, and he's the spiritual father, but this guy has a parish in the wild that he's with every single day. And it, it's just an amazing ministry. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Yeah. And they, and by the way, they do little skits about him that, that <laughs> how how nerdy he is and it and it just shows how much they love him mm -hmm. yeah yeah did, oh. did i say that right ron uh, yeah marvin the martian is who they compare me to <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
how how was how has this energized you? Given you um, just a, a space where you where you've seen some excitement and and flourishing in your your life in general, ministry in particular. Um, you asking me or? Yeah, you you and everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I also taught, taught at the college level before I, I, I was doing this full time. And um, as a single person, it just seemed like um, it's, there's an isolating aspect of that where you're doing a lot of research and, you know, grading papers and things like that. And there's an aspect of that I really like. Um, but uh, it, it just wasn't good for me to be in that kind of uh, aloneness and so forth. So um, Al helped me identify some of the wounds, the genius. No, you you muted. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll get back to. Oh, there you go. You're back with us. Help me connect with you with uh, people that outwardly you wouldn't think that, that we have much in common. But it has brought. I, I've heard a lot of people comment that I, you know I stopped smiling a lot when I was teaching, and uh, I probably didn't be a very good teacher. But um, this is kind of I had some background in youth ministry earlier um, before seminary and uh, I'm kind of getting back back into that and uh, just seeing God work in, in miraculous ways in ways that the world has said is hopeless. Yeah. Um, that has energized my faith quite a bit. Oh, that's good. Good. Yeah. Anyone else? What? How, how has it been life-giving? We talk a lot about the mental health of a pastor. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you talk to the Christians, all if that's all you talk to, it'll turn your hair white. <laughs> and it will, it, but talk getting outside and it's, I, I don't have words to describe the, um, what it did inside of me for just my sanity to have conversations with somebody outside the church. And it's, it, it, it's, it's really life giving. Yeah, for me, uh, I would say the life-giving part is uh, for a long time, I just felt guilty because I wasn't doing enough. And um, and Al was always saying baby steps, incremental. But I think the method to his madness was this is not so much a program that you're doing as a DNA that you adopt and that just flows from you. And I think he has a unique ability to get people to, to switch into that mode a little bit more uh, into, oh, well, hey, there's somebody and you don't even think about it. Hey, tell me about that. Or, hey, what's going on with you on that? You don't even think about it. And I think that that's not so much, okay, I've got a program here. I've got to get after this. Okay, when I get in here, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And I I was that way for a long time. And every time I got on the phone with him, which every other week was, man, I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. And he would always be like, well, <laughs> take a chill pill, <laughs> basically. So that, that's, yeah. been, that's yeah. been life giving to me. Yeah, that's great. It's kind of, for, for me, it's kind of flowed over into our church that uh, it, it did something to my preaching when I would say, I talked to a person in my car this week, and this was our conversation. Mm. I would tell actual stories, and I had people that would say things like, aren't, aren't you scared to talk to people? Or aren't you scared to do this Uber thing? And I was like, no, pe people don't bite. That It actually they would say things like, um, you really do this. You don't just beat us up and make us feel guilty for not inviting people to church and trying to share faith. You actually do it. Mm. And that's, that's energized our church. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're having, so Dave, David's way ahead of me and, uh, and he's, he's, his thoughts are not my thoughts and his ways are not my ways, but I'm trying to get there. And um, uh, we're having this seminar in Greenville now on the first weekend of March. And 
you know, I'm hoping that, that, that it's a, you know, I'm not, it's, it's not the magic bullet or anything, but I think it could begin a good, uh, a very cool conversation in our church. That's what I'm praying for anyway, as I begin to change in the way I think about things. So, you know, okay you're happy tell us about that seminar what what is it what is it what, what do you mean well on Mar on march 4th uh the, at our church there'll be a pastors uh et pastors conference okay. that do. and then on the 5th is for anybody and uh so hopefully our church people will come and others from the community we've been trying to advertise and uh and just see what god will do but i i, yeah. I just i'm just hoping it's a great a great conversation starter mm -hmm. as i told the people on sunday it's not so much the how to evangelism but how to think about evangelism mm -hmm. in this day and age so. yeah yeah before we get to the how to we got to just know how to think and and get, get the framework um just just getting the, the ducks in the right order if we don't ask ourselves why are we putting ducks in order then everything's a mess you know it's, it's, it makes it tough well you know okay so al you 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 do seminars tell tell us about what's what's involved with that so if anyone who's listening going okay, i'd be interested in doing something for area pastors christian leaders people in our church what's what's that by the way um one of the things i wanted to say is you, you were asking how you get energized in the wild and my blues bar is uh just um they make me cry and i've got about 500 people there that call me pastor al they're not obviously not all christians um but i just did a a, a week conference with the anglican union and i put some pictures of all of them in their vestments and me and my collar and chris my bar peeps saw some of the pictures and they were sort of in a panic that i had left them <laughs> That, that, that I had left the bar and become this, you know, this Anglican with the hats and all that. And they were very dear. <laughs> but I say to my bar, would you pray for me? And I say that to non-Christians and they do. And, and they said, you're not, you haven't forgotten about your heathens, have you? I said, not at all. And you, you just bring life to me. And they're my, they, they just are so dear. They follow me around the country in these, things and i send them pictures and all that on we have something called blue church which is not a church in a blues bar but a blues bar that meets for church but it's my working laboratory it's the richest laboratory i've ever been in, in my whole life it's the wild wild west um but the first day that we have i have four full day conferences now i'm going to be doing this track with covenant seminary with their students mm. over the year but the first one that we're doing at Dr. Alfarth's church is what I call Discover. And it's not how to do evangelism, but how to think about it. And we first talk about first principles and how do we approach evangelism and break it down to a first principle? You know, what is evangelism? The second workshop I have is something that it's about the echo chamber and how what's the good thing of the echo chamber and how do you get off of it um the the third workshop is findings from five thousand tattoo interviews listen tattoos aren't about tattoos um we have re-entered the age of the confessor tattoos are confessions looking for a confessor and that's someone who listens and hears and holds They've gotten so desperate, they're writing all over themselves. And the point of the spear in the wild is as a confessor that I call, which is listening, hearing, and holding. So we go over what we found under 5,000 tattoo interviews. The third thing that the fourth thing is um, findings from about 8,000 evangelism encounters. Okay, what happened? What happened when that thing happened? The next thing is about why can't we listen to hear? What's, what's the hang up? What, how have we been wired to where we can't even hear each other? Mm. And the final workshop is 
what I call the six seasons in my blues bar. And I break down the six seasons. The first season was, am I a clown? <laughs> and that lasted about two years. Um, so these are the five workshops that I call discover. The second full day is what I call imagine. So that's what we're going to do at yeah. East Side Presbyterian Church in Greenville on March 4th and on March 5th. Okay. And then you're, you're, you're going to be down in Daytona Beach, is it? The next week? Yeah. Yeah. On uh, March 8th through 11th, I've got a team going in to the Daytona Bike Rally. We did this about three years ago at the Sturgis. You know, I brought, we brought 11 ministers and put them on Main Street of the Sturgis Bike Rally. What could go wrong? You know, what could go wrong with that? And we did 400 interviews of people telling us and we still have relationships with many of those people and it it just um it is something i love to do and love to take a team in but, but the daytona bike rally chris it isn't really a daytona bike rally it's a tattoo festival with bikes <laughs> it's confessions looking for a confessor but they have none yeah Oh, great. Okay. And it, you, you also have an event coming up in October 19th through the 21st. And where's it going to be at? Okay. We don't have a, a location yet. Last year, we did the Explorer Conference in Birmingham, Alabama, the last, the third week in October. And we had 20 speakers, Chris, and they spoke for 20 minutes and then 10 minutes of Q&A and all the guys on here spoke. They were, they were amazing. And we're putting those, what we call TED Talks on our website, evangelizetoday.com. They're amazing. They speak as explorers and they talk about their discovery. Mm -hmm. um, and so we haven't found a home yet. Uh, we, we'd like a central location. Um, you know, the, these guys take their scholarship into the wild and get to see things in slow motion. And then they talk about it in these TED Talks. So we're looking for a home for October 19 to 22 for these 20 speakers this next year called the Explorer Conference. So if anyone who's listening kind of would like to reach out to you and, and at least have the conversation and offer offer a home for that that would be that would be great so just uh, try, try, help helping him helping to make the connections help make the connections well in, in the time we've got remaining um if each of you would take just maybe three sentences at most what would you say um to 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 convince somebody um whether pastor member of a church matters not to convince them that they should engage in an ET residency? Three sentences. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, um, one sentence, wait for it. <laughs> that's that's Hal's big line, wait for it. This is not something that just happens quickly. It's, it's a process and it's, and it's worth it. It's worth it. Good. Thanks. Yeah, usually when, when you go through a process, especially if there's a process that has a financial component, it's hard to say wait for it. Yeah. Because I, I just invested this. I want results. We're good Americans, you know. Come on. Yeah, let, let's let's see it. And that's 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 a hard thing for us to wait. Very true. Yeah. Very good. Anyone else? What's your your pitch? Or your elevator well, pitch? Why don't you do it? Yeah, my experience has been that working with Al is first a discovery of the image of God in me and the spirit of God in me and what God's actually been doing and what he's been up to all this time. And as I experience that with Al, he, it then helps me to see the image of God and the spirit of God in others. Mm. And that has contributed to my, my mental health, my emotional well-being, and my spiritual maturity, and has made me someone who can 
deeply care for the souls of others in ways that I couldn't before. Yeah. I mean, the, and what you just described is the very heart of what we long for as ministers of the gospel, to, to know ourselves so that we can love others well. Uh, so that's great. Well, good. What else? Yeah, I can't, I can't take anybody any farther than I've gone. And one of my, I think my, one of my biggest wounds was this, uh, idea of being emotionally closed and Al will tell you that he's got antenna that are like radio towers he'll tell you why if you talk to him long enough but I felt like my little antennas were just like this and doing being coached by him to see what that's all about has uh, helped me understand myself better um, and then just the I guess the first sentence would be just the, the energy to have somebody uh, over, I don't say over in an authoritative sense, but in a beside you in a friendship sense that's able to say, I affirm you. Mm -hmm. That did, you know, we don't, as a church planner, I didn't have anybody like that. I had a coach and, but it was, Nothing like what you get from having a friendship with, with these guys that we Zoom once a month together. And um, there's, a, there's a friendship that, that grows that's uh, very, very healthy and valuable. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, good. Well, any, any concluding thoughts? Otherwise, we will draw us to, to a close. Want to just remind everybody, we will our next uh, MA conversations will be uh, March 9th. We'll be talking with Dean Faulkner at, um, from RTS Charlotte, the Center for Church Planting. And then the following month, we're going to be talking about church planting for non pastors. That is, uh, any of us that have been involved in church planting uh, hopefully quickly realize it's not up to us. There's a team. So, we're going to hear from, from people that have been involved with church planting, men and women. Um, and help and working in many different ways that make a church plant uh, a reality. And so in, until then, um, Lord bless, we will uh, hopefully be able to follow up uh, later. If you have any questions, you'll be getting, uh, those listening, be getting the uh, inf information, uh, email, and uh, other, other links that will help you explore uh, what it means to explore evangelism with ET. Till then, God bless. Take care.